Well, I don't know. I sort of stumbled into it a little bit. It's, I've always had an interest in sound, you know, from a, from, a, from a young age, being a kid, and listening to symphonies, things like um, the Nutcracker Suite and um, Peter and the Wolf. I think Peter and the Wolf might have had a, a, a tremendous impact without me really even realizing it because all the characters in that original story were told with musical instruments, like the flute was the bird and all kinds of different instruments were different animals. And that, that story actually used to really like scare the hell out of me. And it was Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, and things like that that really got me thinking about sound effects. I think it was probably seeing a making of Empire Strikes Back, seeing Ben Bird out there recording, tapping on the wires for the lasers and recording this, the, the metal punching machine that became things like the Millennium Falcon doors. And I just thought that was the coolest thing ever, that you could go out and record sound and, and make things for films. But that was when I was about 14 years old, and I think... I just sort of put it out of my mind, just thinking it was cool, but I really didn't think that it was something I could actually do. And I went to off to normal college and got an accounting minor and a business degree. And I got out and I was um, associate manager of a, of a finance company for a couple of years. And I was not very good at my job. So I learned in about two and a half years what I never, ever wanted to do again. You know, I used to buy like, I don't know, I forget what the name of the magazine was, Home Studio Recording or something like that. And I kept seeing these ads for recording schools in there. So I wound up calling Full Sail, and I went down there and toured the school, and before I even flew home, you know, made up my mind I was going to go there. When I went there, I actually did know I wanted to do sound effects for film. I was lucky enough to at least know that that's what I wanted to do. I got my first gig as an intern at EFX. And they were kind of strapped for cash. They were sort of in a financial bind, really. And, I, you know, it was sort of a mutually beneficial arrangement because they needed somebody cheap and I needed experience. And it's, the experience in actually editing and cutting is the thing that I think you can never theorize quite successfully. You can't learn it just by thinking about it and thinking you're going to just step into a chair and, and do it. You've got to practice. You've got to sit down. Um, Hear the sounds in your head and then try to make those sounds because you know, particularly with, with things like making things big, you know, you may go out and record a car door close and you want it to be bigger than it is. You, you think it's going to sound huge, but when you put it in the film or in any other show, it just doesn't sound as big as you thought it was. And I was so gung-ho the first few years particularly that I would stay all night, whether I was getting paid for it or not, and just practice. I remember some nights I used to stay and work on a single explosion all night long, trying to make it sound the way I wanted to. I would bring in explosions from movies I liked and load them into the synclavier and, and put them up against picture and, and, you know, and then try to mimic what was done. Um, go in and try to figure out the little elements they use, little bits and pieces of this and that. So I was sort of copycatting sounds I liked from movies I liked, like Terminator 2 or from Indiana Jones, things like that. So getting to stay all night and practice those things was, was of utmost importance. So that's where I really got started. The first film I worked on was called, oh God, what was the name of it? And I did backgrounds like, like traffic backgrounds in New York for this whole film. And then I was sort of, I sort of became the background guy for every film that came through. I was doing backgrounds for every TV show we had in house, like Renegade, Silk Stockings. I was doing backgrounds for all these these shows. So and eventually, I think the first film I sound designed myself was Mortal Kombat, which was a lot of fun, and it was a it was a really short schedule, and it was a really small crew, but I learned a lot doing that show. Uh, Harry Cohen told me literally on the first Mortal Kombat film. He said, these whooshes you're making for these camera buy, these camera pans, he said, make as many of them as you can because in three years you won't be able to make those anymore because you'll, you'll be in a different phase of your career, different sensibilities, you'll be pulling from different sounds and you won't be able to do the things you're doing now. So, you know, basically blast it out of the park, make as many as you can based on what you're doing now. So I did that, so I have a whole palette of wishes and things from that era that I still use occasionally now. 
my favorite film for sound is still, after all these years, Empire Strikes Back. Um, it's it, To me, it's sort of a benchmark in, now I guess Star Wars probably would have been the biggest level, but Empire Strikes Back to me uh, was was my favorite one still, in that there was never there had never been a leap from here to here in in sound effects the way they was in those films. It's just got this real world sound that's gritty, it's dirty. Uh, Millennium Falcon, R two D two, the lasers. I mean, you name it. Anything that's in that film, the Tie Fighters, were just absolutely groundbreaking. I think the sound designer term has been through lots of iterations since it was conceived. I think Ben Burt was the first one coined as a sound designer, and and in the beginning it, it was someone who saw film all the way through from you know pre-production all the way through the final mix, someone who basically is sort of a supervisor in a lot of ways, but also creates sounds. And over the years it's sort of been, you know, I don't know, I, I don't want to necessarily say it's been watered down, but it's certainly uh, a different you know, you can be a sound designer now and not see something through from the very beginning because it's very rare for a person these days to be on from pre-production all the way through production and through the, the edit and into the final mix. So a sound designer these days a lot of times is someone who it comes up with interesting things that you can't just go record. Uh, that's not entirely true. Sometimes sometimes the sound design of a film is based on reality-based sound, and it's, and it's all a matter of choice. It's what you choose to suit the emotion of the scene. Uh, can, can be real sounds that are just flat-out recorded and just carefully chosen to picture. But I think in, as far as my involvement with the credit, it's been to make sounds that you can't go record. You know, like say, a, you know, say a cave troll or a, or a dragon or you know anything like that uh, that you can't go out in the real world and record. You've got to see the image, come up with a sound for this that hopefully is a signature sound people will remember and it, and it suits the film and is a more of a creative role. It's really hard to sort of get the point across because the Sinclair was such a great performance tool. You really got your hands on it. And you could, you, we basically had to condense files, you know, from into, into smaller chunks, sort of like premixing in a way. And then now you, you put in Pro Tools, you put every little individual element, you know, 30 elements for one thing. On the Synclavier, you did that on your own right away. And you could perform things, you could ride the pitch, you know, you were, it, it really felt like you had your hands on it, which you don't anymore. You're sort of clicking and pointing and clicking and, and, that's you know there's a, there's a certain great thing about that as well, but the Sinclair was was a, a really great tool that I wish we had something like it now. Well, I've been fortunate in my career to be involved with fil not only films but video games. A lot of what I do for video games is cinematic type things, so it's sort of a film style. It's linear cutscene that you know we go treat it this, almost the same as we would a film. It's cut in surround. It's mixed in surround. Uh, that format is is very similar, and and in a lot of ways, uh, there is no, is very little difference. Um, uh, there's sounds I I make for for my work in games that sometimes I use for films, and vice versa. They in in my particular experience, they complement each other quite well. I mean, I don't know exactly what you'd call my style. It's it, it's, I mean, the, the types of films I guess I've worked on tend to be, uh, you know, sort of in the fantasy realm. I mean, it's certainly the ones that the, the bigger credits I've had are in, in, a, in, a, in a fantasy realm. I don't use synthesizers a lot. I honest, honestly, when I do use them, it's sort of a hunt and peck and make sure I record everything I'm doing because I'll never be able to get back to it again. I don't really know that much about synthesizers, so it's more of a hit and miss sort of thing. Sometimes it's a happy accident. You know that happens in real in, in in real in real world sound design too. Sometimes what I'll do is just pull a bunch of things out onto a bunch of tracks, hit play, and just see what happens. And sometimes there's a really cool thing that happens. You know that I wouldn't have never have done on my own. Well, when I, when I first started out, you know you get really sort of tedious with what you're doing. You try to make sure that everything is in perfect sync. That it, that you know every little footstep or every little event perfectly matches what you see on screen. And as I was sort of studying some films, 
that I liked the sound of because that's what I would do. I would I was working at night. I would stay up all day, you know, and and watch films I liked and, and listen to them and try to figure out why they worked, why they elicited a certain response from me, why I enjoyed them. And what I sort of found out is a lot of them didn't have sounds that were perfectly in sync. There was a certain cadence to the, to the way sounds were laid up. There was one, the one scene in Terminator 2 where the tanker was, was slamming the, the pickup truck they were in, a little pickup truck up against the, the wall. And there was something about this one shot that had the truck hitting it, then it's skidding against the, the brick wall or the concrete wall, the glass smashing into the, into the truck, the scream of the, of, of, the, of the characters, all these things sort of played off each other just like, like this. And it had this wonderful cadence to it, one sound following another. And as I went back and looked at it, I noticed that the truck hit wasn't in perfect sync. Neither was the glass break. There was a certain, certain pattern to them. The sound sort of played as almost like a musical piece in a way. It wasn't musical, but it had a certain pattern to it that, that just played. And I find now that, you know, after... 20 years of experience or so, that I find myself being way, way, way less anal about sync. Well, if you look back historically, I mean, like some of my favorite films, Empire Strikes Back, sound-wise, Empire, Empire Strikes Back, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Jurassic Park, uh, a lot of these were cut on mag, a uh, film which has a certain warm, fat sound to it that has been tough to replicate for us. I mean, in, in the old days too, there was way fewer tracks to cut with. Now we have Pro Tools and we have almost infinite tracks to cut with. We, we probably deliver way more to the mix than we ever should. I think that something that was great about the old days was you, they had to really think about it ahead of time and choose what they're going to use and sort of pre, almost pre-mix it in a way, you know, pre-filter out. This, these, these are the sounds we're going to go with. These are the ones that are off screen. These aren't going to matter, so we're going to focus on these sounds. And now we sort of cover everything and wait for the mix to, to d determine what's going to be good or not. Uh, I think the quality of the sounds is probably better now than they, than they used to be. The microphones we're using are better. The recorders are phenomenal. We have recorders like a little Sony N10 or something that a lot of us are taking around with us to pick things up that we normally would never have. So I think we have access to more sounds than, we, than they used to have in the past because you, you, in order to take a Nagra out, you had to have, what, eight? D batteries and, and reels of quarter inch tape. You know, and now we have we can fit a 32 gig micro SD card in a little pocket recorder and go out and record for hours and hours and hours. And that way you have sounds you would never get before. So I think we have access to more cooler sounds than maybe they used to in the past. Yeah, well the workflow has certainly changed. I mean when I first started we were cutting on synclaviers. Um, and laying back to 24-track tape. So we only had a certain amount of tracks that we could even deliver to a mix. We, I think in, a, in the effects department, sometimes we would deliver the backgrounds and the effects on a 24-track tape. So the backgrounds may have six or eight tracks, and the effects would have the rest. And now we have, you know, like on some of the recent films I've worked on, we've had premixes A through P, and each, each, each premix has 32 channels available to it, so the workflow has definitely changed. You know, some of them we've forgotten about. We take for granted now. Uh, digital picture. You know, when I first started, it was three-quarter inch tape that was chasing the time code. So every time I wanted to check if a punch was in sync, I had to roll the quarter-inch tape back. I mean, the three-quarter-inch video back. Hit play. Wait for the thing to lock up and see. Now you got Pro Tools. You got, you know, digital video. You can you can nudge a, an event to to be in sync with the picture, and it's you can almost guarantee it's going to be in sync. In Pro Tools now, we're, we can basically mix in, in the box, and it's almost the same as it is through a, through a console. I know some people will disagree with that philosophy. The plugins, the reverbs are great. Um, the panning's great. The, uh, the, the subwoofer plugins are all fantastic. Um, there's almost nothing you can't do inside the box. The, the thing that I would say the, the thing that may be missing is the size of the rooms we get to work in because... Uh, the, uh, how a pan travels in a room this size is different than, one, than how it travels in a, in a theater-sized room. Locked now just means the current version, and it's usually out of date by the time the picture even lands in, in, our, in our department. Sometimes we get picture changes three or four times a day. 
it's the thing that I keep trying to tell students and and uh, lay people about is the picture that you're looking at is not one that we worked on, you know, because we didn't get to see it until you see it. You know, the visual effects we're working with are are uh, rudimentary, sometimes not even animated. They're just placeholders. Sometimes they're just cards, you know, black background with text that tells us what's going to go there, and we have to guess. And uh, we did. We just had a, a show we just did where, after we've even mixed it, there was a 91, 91 edit change. So we had to go back and rethink everything. It wasn't just a it wasn't just a couple of trims here and there. It was like a reorganization of the whole reel. So I had to go reconstruct it from what I had and try to make it work and make it flow. A lot of people I know are using change notes for uh, their picture changes, which means that you had uh, pretty much have to to conform your reels every time. You go to from version 10 to 11, you gotta go from 10 to 11 because the picture department doesn't only gives you a change note from one version to the next. The way we've been working for the past 15 years or more is to use EDLs instead of change notes. That way, when the picture department gives us their picture, they also give us an EDL based on what that version of the picture reflects. So what often happens for me is I'll skip version numbers entirely. I'll go from, I may work on version 10, and I may not touch it again until version 17, or maybe even later. Now, if I was doing change notes, I'd have to have a, I'd have to contact a picture department and say, you know, I need a change note from version 10 to version 18, or, you know, whatever version I went to. When I've got the EDLs that come with each version, I can use Conformalizer to import those two, D, two EDLs and go straight from whatever version I was at to whatever version I want to work at now and skip all of those versions in between, which to me is, is a great time saver, and I honestly can't imagine trying to work and keep every version of every reel up for every time a picture change comes through. When these EDLs come in, we usually have assistants that go through them and compare the picture version um, with, with with each update and they can there's a there's a feature in conformalizer that can compare the picture you know a, an overlay of one picture version to the other and show the differences so the assistants can see right away what the what the changes are if any you can see that maybe uh, say a fireball for instance you know that used to exist in this frame you can just see that it, it maybe happens three frames later now and the assistant can tell you exactly what that change is you don't have to wonder where it's moved to Sometimes the, the, the note will come back that there's a change, and we'll go, okay, well, that's, there is a change. Maybe a, the visual effects updated a little bit, but there's nothing that affects sound. So we usually get emails coming through like going, okay, the, the changes are here, here, and here, and here. These are the ones that affect sound and what department. Um, so it's, it's very fluid in that way. Well, you know, working in Pro Tools, uh, there's so many tools available that make basically mixing possible in the box. Um, Pro Tools has had a, a surround panner for a number of years, but it's been sort of difficult to use, clunky to use. Um, you know, buying the joysticks was expensive and, and it's just tough to implement. They had that f funny sort of, you know, um, left to right knob for the front, left to right left to right knob for the back and it was just that you couldn't using knobs you could never make a pan without you know three or four passes trying to get the thing done so uh, spanner came along uh, spanner's got a lot of great features in it not only like audio suite being able to fold things down and do things like that work on a you know up to a 7-1 uh, track and being able to pan independently each leg but uh, a couple of years ago, I, I switched from using the Pro Tools panner to using Spanner on each track um, because uh, it had this great iPad app where I could I could use my fingers to to control you know whether it's a mono or stereo file I could pan it around like a joystick and you know I already had the iPad so the the, the, the app was free and it integrated with Spanner perfectly and I also found that with the Artist Mix the the controls were laid out really well in Spanner to in one pass be able to to do a pan that I think is more as accurate or more accurate than they can do on the stage. I mean, it's got this overlay feature which, which lays right on top of the picture so I can see exactly where the channels are, whether it's left the left to right position on the, on the picture and also the front to back position. So it's just really fast to dial up. I don't have to reach up across the board to, to I don't have to assign the channels to a, 
to joysticks and reach up and grab them and, and stretch my back. It's all like right here in front of me. Thank <laughs> you.